All right, so your last talk of the day is me. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Nicole Embertson. I work up at the Whatcom Conservation District. I'm a nutrient management specialist, but I assist farms all throughout the state on programs, bringing new educational events with other districts, um, just whatever is needed. So I jokingly am told I really know my shit. So uh, with that, let's get on to it. So what I want to talk to you guys about today is manure application risk management. How do we keep your manure on your field where it belongs? So before I even get started on that, I was up in Canada recently and I was there with a farmer and a couple of their kind of regulatory folks up there just kind of showing them a lot of the tools that we've got here in the States and what they may want to do. And the, Regulatory guy, you know, was talking to the farmer and he kept saying, yeah, we're, we want to talk to you about waste management. We've got this waste rule that we have to do. Um, you know, I want to know more about your waste system. And the farmer said, just stop. If you call my manure waste one more time, you're off my farm. And this is a really good antidote that it's not a waste product unless you actually waste it. Unless you put it on when you don't need it, you put it on too much, you put it on the wrong time. If it leaves your field in some way, whether that's up in the air, down in the groundwater, or off in the surface water, you wasted that product. And yes, it's a waste. This farmer knew the extreme value of that product that he had. How important manure was to his soil quality, his crop quality, to his quality of life and maintaining his farm and keeping it going. And you obviously are all here because you have manure. You've got some product, whether it be dairy manure, chicken manure, horse manure, you take it from someone else, you put it on a crop you have because you know how beneficial it is. It's a great product and I might be a little biased as a nutrient management specialist, but I think it's the most important thing on your farm. So with that in mind, we're gonna talk about manure use and I'm not going to talk about waste until it becomes a waste product. How does it become a waste, right? So when does a runoff event occur? We're going to talk about that in particular because we're pretty concerned about water quality, but this applies in any way. It can be lost up, down, or all around. So number one, it's got to be there. So you need that pollutant availability. You've put something out there. It can be a chemical-based fertilizer that still has nutrients in it. It can be your manure. Uh, whatever it is, you put something out there. Maybe you've done that improperly. You got the timing wrong. You got a little nervous, like, oh man, it's going to rain. I'm going to get out there before the rainstorm. Please don't ever do that again. Uh, we'll have ways. I'll show you some nice tools to check the weather to know a little bit of rain, fine. It's going to wash it off the forage into the soil. A lot of rain, it's going to take it off. Maybe you used the wrong method. Maybe you should have put solids out and you did liquids instead, or maybe you use a big gun when you should use an injector, whatever it may be, there's a method and then rates. This is obviously the most important one. If you put too much out there, it's available for transport. So kind of matching that up with what you need based on your soil conditions and your crop needs, etc., is pretty important. And then we need a catalyst, right? This is in Western Washington. We love it here because it's green and it's beautiful, but that means it rains a lot. I, moving here eight years ago, have to still be reminded of this by my husband every winter. Honey, I know the winter's hard, but it's beautiful because it rains. Okay, but the point being, we've got a lot of precipitation that can create a catalyst to get something off your field. Flooding is also a big issue for a lot of folks, depending on where you live. High water tables, we get that water table, it comes right to the surface it's almost like you know rain on top there's nothing left for anything like manure to get into that soil surface so if your water tables up you get rain on top it has to move off of there if I poured you know a, a gallon of water on the floor it's gonna spread out the best it can same thing that happens to rain on your field so when there's nothing to take it in it goes wind is also a big one if you apply with a big gun or you put solids out in your field and there's wind that's going to drift you can get that right into someone's you know car if they're driving by which is the worst case scenario um you get into a waterway etc so that's something you really have to pay attention to and lastly is poor field conditions this is your easiest thing to avoid amazingly was that if you've got a challenging soil type that is clay or peat or something that saturates a really long time and you're just waiting 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 to get out there that's going to cause some challenges slope as well so you may think oh i can get out there and i've got my setback distance that's in my plan 
But if that field is sloping to there, you've got exponentially a greater and greater risk for transport to there. So we have to be farther and farther back during our high risk seasons. Surface cover, if you've got a fallow field versus a nice thick stand of forage, those two things have significantly different kind of effects on how water is going to run off of there, um, how it's going to get out of there. Um, kind of an analogy of that, if there was only five people in this room and I ran through it, I'd probably get through there pretty easy, right? That would mean the pretty sparse vegetation. But if you all stood up and I tried to run through, I'm going to hit a lot of you. And the point being that as that water moves through, it's going to be hitting forage, it's going to get down into the soil surface, it's going to stop all that sediment from moving. That's your, what your field cover does, it's pretty important. And then saturated soils, this is the worst thing. That soil is saturated, anything on top is going to move off. So all of these things combine in some way can cause a runoff event, even a leaching event or an air quality, a volatilization loss as well. So these are the things we think about. And we put these into categories called the four R's of nutrient management. And every time I hear this, I laugh because the only R is that they all start with right. The right time, the right rate, the right source, the right placement. But I think it's ridiculous enough that it actually makes me remember it every time. So when we think about these things, this is kind of like the what, when, where, why kind of concept when we think about what source. So this is, do I choose liquids or solids? If I'm taking manure, do I want to use chicken manure right now? Do I want composted horse manure? Do I want liquid dairy manure? That's picking your source for your timing, your needs, your crop. The right rate, this is self-explanatory. This is figuring out how much you need on that field for that crop right now during the season. And there, we kind of heard a little bit about that. It can also be one of the more challenging things to figure out, but there are a lot of resources to assist with that. And then we've got the right placement. So this is you know, where in your field are you avoiding swales during high risk times? Are you uh, like a right distance from a waterway, a ditch, etc.? This makes a difference if it's June versus if it's March on the placement of where things are going to go. And lastly, the timing. This is probably one of the key things. So I've done a lot of research on this, looking at this, what things make the biggest difference. And timing is huge. That's making sure we're not applying when we're going to have a weather catalyst event. Um, that's choosing the right time of year to go out. That's coordinating with your crop cycles and everything else. So that timing is pretty important. And it's these two things, the timing and placement, that created uh, this application risk management system, or I'm going to refer to it as ARM. It's just an easy acronym. And that kind of revolves around what I want to show you today on how to help you keep your manure in your field and avoid losing it in some other transport way. So if you want to apply manure, and it, again, it doesn't matter what type of farmer you are, uh, if you want to apply manure, the first thing obviously is calculating that agronomic rate. Do you even need manure out there? And if so, how much? Great. Next is identifying which field that should be out on. That's thinking about, okay, what are all the things that could cause a problem? What are my low risk versus high risk fields? Determining when to apply, knowing the forecast, et cetera. Assessing your current field conditions. Is it saturated out there right now? Is there flooding? Is it frozen, et cetera? And lastly, obviously, is applying and then monitoring those fields, making sure your tiles aren't discharging, uh, making sure you didn't cause an issue, and then if you do, fixing it if you can. But it's the three in the middle that are kind of the most important and that we've built some tools to help you discover and work on. And I'm going to show you each one of these from field risk maps to find that field, seasonal manure application setbacks, a real-time manure spreading advisory that's been developed for the whole Puget Sound, and application risk management worksheet for doing that field level assessment on that specific day. So the first one is identifying low risk fields. And we've done this by a mapping. And if you have a dairy nutrient management plan, your conservation district or whoever wrote your plan has created a map for you. It may not be as cool and colorful as this one, but you can go get one. If you haven't had maps, your conservation district can do that for you too. Or maybe you're pretty savvy and you do your own in Google. Awesome. Either way, uh, what this, what you're seeing here is we've done a risk assessment. And as a farmer, you know your field way better than we do. We're just going to verify and kind of highlight some th certain things for you to point out some areas that we want to look for. And this also is an easy way if you've got a hired field guy, a custom guy, whatever it is, you can say, hey, go out to the low risk fields right now. In the summer, June, everything is low risk. 
But so when we think about our fields from October to about June, since it can be wet all the way through, at least through March, we want to think, all right, what are, what are my blue fields? Blue being low risk, red being high risk. We're going to think of that in rainbow order. Uh, if I wanted to apply right now, for instance, I'd be looking at these, low, these blue fields. These ones in particular are low risk because this is a sandy, well-drained soil. There's no ditches nearby. It's kind of on a high ground. This guy's really lucky. He's got some great acres. And then he's got some that are kind of in between. Uh, these are kind of medium risk fields, meaning like maybe I can, maybe I can't. I really have to do a good field assessment. And then these high risk fields, he's not even considering those until maybe March or April most likely because they're just so wet. They're in lowlands, they're peat, they're clay lenses, whatever it is, they're a real pain. So this is what we think about for runoff risk rating and having this assessment done for your farm. Some fields are both, this one has a pretty severe slope down to that um, waterway, so that's why it kind of ranks out a much higher risk. So those things are also all taken into account, not just your soil type. And then conversely, there's a leaching risk rating. And this we're mostly concerned about late summer into early fall. And I'm going to show you a graph after this that diagrams our kind of runoff concern and why, leaching concern and why, and how those things are opposite. But you'll see this map is opposite. These really low risk for runoff are now high risk for leaching. Why? Because they're super well drained. Anything on the surface, when we start getting all that fall rain, is going to shoot right through that soil profile, right below your root zone, and it's available to loss to groundwater. So those are the fields that Sherry showed, you know, on October 1st, if you had 45 parts per million on a forage field, let's say, you're going to get through the winter just fine. If you're putting anything on after that, it is waste disposal. We've switched from a nutrient to a waste product, and especially if you've done that on these really well-drained fields, you're going to have tons of nitrate loss. And this is because the soil is still warm. Anything you put out there, if those soil microbes are converting that organic nitrogen and ammonium nitrogen that Joe talked about and converting that to nitrate, but your plant uptake is decreasing quite a bit. So let's look at that. Let's talk about forages or anything resembling forages. It's going to have a general graph like this. We're starting January through December. And our crop growth has been, you know, kind of uh, plateaued most of the winter, even a cover crop, same idea. And it's going to start slowly taking off. And April, May, we're going to get a good takeoff here soon. And it's going to do that until it comes to maturity and or it starts um, slowing down. And then we get a significant decrease into the late summer, fall, and then we get that taper off again. So this is our general crop growth curve. And if we think about how does manure come into this, well, you can apply manure, let's say you're able to get out there on January, you're able to get out here now, sometimes it's a little later. The one thing about manure is, as I just mentioned, it doesn't have nitrate in it. That has to be converted by the soil. So if you put manure out right now, that could take over a month to become plant available. Soil's got to warm up, it's got to convert. You put that out in the summer though, that can be a week before it's ready. That soil's a lot warmer, if you still have moisture in there, it's going to become available pretty quick. Compost will take a little bit longer, liquid manure is a little bit faster, uh, but the point being, you've got a little bit of a lag until it catches up, and then once it gets going, you're going to have a nice match up for a while, but if you kept putting it on, as is normal, right, and maybe you just kind of overshot those nutrient needs, because it can be a little hard to calculate that, suddenly you've got more manure available, then you've got uptake, and you've got this gap as that slowly comes down. And it's this gap right here that is that excess nutrients that's available for losses. So when we look at our precipitation curve throughout the year, dry period, not a big issue. But if we start looking at the fall, if we've got that excess and we've got that catalyst of rain, suddenly this is the time when we've got a high leaching risk. This is not that time. So we don't have a lot of nitrate, per se, out there in the early fall. And our soils are just in a different class, a different um, characterization. But this is when we're really concerned, the most concerned about runoff. You can have a runoff event any time of the year, but this is the hot time for it. It's right now, and you guys know why. Your fields are wet, things are a little bit harder to deal with. Uh, we're putting out manure, the crops aren't quite getting it all up and in there, it's on the surface. 
So that's why we consider those two things a little bit different. And so in mentally, you're going to think your field's a little bit different. It takes a little <laughs> bit more work, but it gives you far more customization of your manure, your fields, your timing, your activities. And once you do this a couple times, you really get the hang of it. The first time is always hard, as change sucks, right? <laughs> Everyone, but this is a really positive, good change. So it, it does work out for you pretty po uh, positively in the end. So next, we know what field we're going to pick. We know why we're doing that. So now let's determine when to apply. And how many people use TSUM 200 as like, oh, it's time to go? Maybe you're thinking that in your head. Uh, if you've heard of TSUM 200, it's essentially, a lot of people use this as a way to say, okay, it's my first fertilization time period. And it was developed in the Netherlands. It's just a way to gauge crop growth or grass growth. But it doesn't quite match up. It usually hits around this time of year, depending on where you are. And it's a decent gauge, like your fall nitrate test. It's kind of a gauge, but not an absolute. So you want to apply using a handful of more absolute terms. And I'm going to show you this live in a second, but we've created a manure spreading advisory that you can access from that WA Dairy Plan website. You can do it from your phone if you want to follow along right now. Uh, there is a button that says click here from a mobile device. It is mobile optimized. But essentially, I've zoomed in here. Um, I'll show you the live version. You can see the entire Puget Sound and find all of your individual farms. But if you zoom in here and you click on the map where my farm is, what's going to pop up is a handful of resources for you. Number one, it's going to give you the date and it's going to give you the 24-hour precipitation forecast and the 72-hour precip forecast. These are things you have to record for your record keeping, but they're also really nice ways to look at like how much rain are we going to get in the next 24 hours, but more importantly in the next three days as that is when you're going to have your highest probability of a runoff event and your biggest risk. And it'll give you the risk rating with that. Right now, everything is really high. Um, had you checked this a few days ago, it was nice and low. You had a few days for application window. And now we're supposed to get a lot of rain tonight into the next few days, and it's come back up. Two things, uh, links on here. I'm going to go over this one in a minute, field risk assessment. But you've got this NOAA weather link. And this goes to what uh, Sherry showed earlier. This is the best and most accurate precipitation site because it's based on modeling data from NOAA. And that is the place that you can find it, Think, and it'll be for your zone. So I highly recommend you access it from there. It's going to give you all sorts of great stuff. I recommend you kind of check this out at home. Uh, but number one, it gives you this precipitation in six hour blocks. So you can see like, oh, in the morning I'm good. Whoa, tomorrow evening that's a lot of rain, for instance. Gives you wind speed. This is great if you're going to pull out a big gun or you want to spread some solids. If it's supposed to be 30 mile an hour winds, Later that day or the next day, maybe you postpone a day and find those times when the wind is a lot lower. Uh, it gives you just all sorts of great stuff that as a farmer is very handy um, and cool to look at. And I kind of, as a scientist, super geek out on this stuff too. So, uh, The next uh, is that where um, kind of placement bit. So in your nutrient management plans, if you have one, you may have a static setback distance and they're already dictated or the new capital permit or others want to say you want 100 feet all year round. What we've discovered is for manure application setback distance, this is not a permanent vegetated area, but rather how far your manure is placed from a high risk area, a ditch, a swale, etc. We've got this kind of goes differently throughout the year. In the summer, our really dry time, you can be 10 feet from that waterway, that ditch, etc. Because we want to make sure you've got maximum fertilization on that field, that you're getting that crop, the nutrients that it needs, and that we're not going to have an issue. Please, you know, check the manure spreading advisory to avoid any weird rainstorms that we get. Um, but that's general guidance. If you have a big gun, by the way, this is always 40 feet. Do not put your big gun 10 feet from a ditch because you get a lot of drift off of that. So you want to be able to account for that. In the shoulder seasons, September going into the fall or come in April, March, April, May, it's 40 feet. This is a pretty reasonable distance um, and best available science and research out there shows that this is a pretty decent distance for reducing that loss of nutrients from that manure application to that edge. Again though, very customized <coughs> your field. If you've got a 9 or 10% slope, this is going to be much greater. 
So this is kind of general, but your field plan working with your planner is going to customize these as appropriate. <coughs> and then in the high risk seasons, October or in that February, 80 feet, you're doubling up. You're not going to lose nutrient value on the edges. Trust me, it'll make it up. We've done forage trials and it doesn't um, have a negative impact on there. But this is your insurance policy to make sure you're far enough back when your fields are in challenging conditions and or we get very big rain events. So this is to your benefit um, on those fields. So the next and last part of this assessment, you know what field, you've checked the spreading advisory, you know what your setbacks are gonna be if you're gonna get out there. Now let's make sure that the field that you wanna to apply to can be applied to. And so I'm gonna to move to the live version of this so we can do it together. So you've gone to the Washington Dairy Plan website and you're going to click, by the way, there's a tab here for weather. Um, a lot of the weather resources that we mentioned you can find there. And again, I know it says dairy plan, but this is for everybody. I might change that to Washington manure plan, um, just so it doesn't alienate horse folks or others who want to use this. Um, so you're going to go to that manure spreading advisory button up here. I'm going to click that. And now you'll be able to see um, that it's for the whole Puget Sound zone. So you're going to zoom in wherever your farm is. Um, let's just generally kind of go to where we're at here in the uh, Unumclaw area. I'm just going to click here near the town. And voila, I can see that I've got my 24 hour, my 72 hours, quite a bit of rain coming. But what I'm going to click is this field risk assessment. And you don't want to do this more than 24 hours in advance because the weather changes, your field changes, a lot changes. So do this the morning of, the day before, if you've got to kind of get things um, in line and rolled up. And what you're going to find here is that first, obviously, is where your dairy farm in your county is. Your county is asked on here so that it kind of corresponds where, where you're at in working with your district. The date that you want to apply, your field name or unit, and then it's going to autofill the, the precipitation data for you from that manure spreading advisory because this can be kind of a challenging one to find. Because I just tried it here, what you'll notice is this says, no, uh uh, uh, you are not applying right now. This is way too much rain coming. So it will kind of override if you hit a threshold. I'm going to change this just for example sake for now. And I'll just downgrade that one just a hint. The next one is entering your soil type. This is on your field maps. There's also things called web soil survey that you can find soils information that's free. There's an app that goes through that, that wherever you're standing, it tells you what soil you're on and all sorts of stuff about it. You can really get a lot of info. I'll have all those links on the website with all these presentations so you can find it. Let's click a silt type soil. And then this one is also, it's very important, soil moisture. This is making sure your field is gonna be able to take whatever manure type you're putting onto it. And some general rules of thumb here to help you figure it out. Below 60 means your soil is dry. You probably should irrigate, or if you can't irrigate, it's just a dry time, it is what it is. If you're right around this 60 to 70, 70%, 70 that means you can comfortably drive a tractor out there, you're not worried about tearing up your field, you're not gonna make divots and ruts, that's a good soil level. We're hitting that 80 to 90, maybe you're like, well, I think I'm gonna pull the big gun out, I don't wanna ruin my field, or let's take the big floater tires, that's when you're hitting that. If you're up in this 90 plus, that means you walk out there and you hear squish, 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 or you someone try to get a tractor out there and they're stuck until the summer, don't be out there during that time. So that means you've got a lot of standing water out there and your risk is just extremely high. I'll talk about some of those conditions, but let's say right now we're kind of hovering in this 80 to 90 range. This is pretty common for a lot. Of, and you're going to get some feedback as you go through on risk and cautions, etc. The next is water table depth. You can get this from a variety of different sources. This can be from you've got it gauged off a local ditch or you've got um, some other information nearby, you can dig a hole. If you don't hit water by about two feet, you're below our concern zone and things are going to be okay. So let's say our water table's at 36 inches. And then the forage density, like I said, can you run, you know, quickly through a room and not hit anything? That's not, you're probably have a fallow field or whatever. Or do you have that nice thick forage stand that's going to keep things from running off your field? I'm going to put 90 to 100 because I believe you guys have amazing forage stands out there. 
Forge Height, did you let your cattle graze it down to a putting green? Or did you just go crazy with your cutting and, uh, and get that down a little too far? What we want to see is at least three inches of forage, because if it's less than that, water can run off a lot easier. So if you've got at least some water on there, it's not, or at least some forage, the water will kind of push it down, it won't run off. We want to make sure we have a little forage out there um, if we're looking at this time of year. And then field surface condition. This is kind of like idiot proofing, if you will. So it's asking you, do you have flooding? You know, if so, don't, don't apply. Or how about if you have frozen again, let's not get out there. I mean, a little crust on top is very different than an inch of frozen field. Again, either of those two things, you're losing whatever you put out. You've put out a waste product. But things like ponding may or may not be okay. If you've got a ponded area in your field because it's a funky low spot, but it doesn't drain anywhere, that's all right. Just stay away from it, you know, at least 10 or so feet and keep on keeping on. But if that ponded area, you've V-ditched it, or it drains somewhere because it has a swale, then that is a um, waterway. This is a drill of the emergency system. In the event of severe weather, you will be notified to shelter in place until further information is provided. The drill will last 60 seconds. This is a drill. All right, back to it. Um, so if that ponded area actually drains somewhere, then you want to have setbacks from that, like you would have setbacks from a stream, a swale, or anything else. So just treat it as a waterway if that's the case. Uh, tiles is the same. It's okay to have tiles. In fact, many of our fields can't be farmed without them. Just make sure they're not running real fast. If they are, that means you've got water up to that probably two feet or however far it was installed. Or if you've got, if we're in the late fall and you've got tiles running and you've had great worm activity and you have all these big pore spaces, which is great for aeration of your soil, but not great if you put manure on and they shoot right through those to your tiles. So just be paying attention to what your tiles are doing at any time of the year. Um, and then manure application equipment, this is just going to ask you um, about these things as kind of a correlation to that soil moisture. Are we kind of matching up? Are things looking okay? And then lastly, do you have a water body or critical area nearby? This is just a double check to make sure you did your homework on picking your manure setback distances right. So let's say if I try to put in 40 right now, it's going to say, I don't think so. Uh, let's try again here. And then you're going to fix it and put an 80. And I'll say, yes, that's correct. Let's go for it. And then lastly, do you have a buffer on your field? Attention, attention. The drill of emergency systems related to severe weather has ended. Please resume normal activities. Thank you. OK, normal Nicole, activity. Nicole, yeah. on that uh, applicator right. method, you don't have like manure spreader like that? Is it just? you have for solid? So it can be surface, surface application, okay. splash plate, tank, et cetera, an aerator, below surface applicator, or irrigation sprinkler. So your solids would be in the surface application. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then do you have a dedicated vegetative buffer? If you have a grass field, that is a dedicated, that's a vegetative buffer. Or maybe you have installed an actual like 35 or some odd filter strip next to a field or you've got a hedgerow or a buffer or something else, that's where you want to account for that because that is going to help you reduce pollution event and transport. So at the very end of this, we've gone through all of that and then we get a risk rating at the very bottom. This could be anywhere from low, medium, high or something in between. In this case, we pulled a medium and we can say, all right, that means I can most likely get out to that field, but I need to be very cautious. And maybe you want to look at that and think, okay, why, was, why is it medium? What's causing that? And you can go back up and look at all of the different risk ratings that came through and try to do a little self-evaluation and understanding of what that may be. And also, when you get through the end of this, print it out for your records. So right-click on here. Uh, and just press print and it'll print on whatever system you have set up for there. If you click send at the bottom, it's going to go to your uh, nutrient management planner at your conservation district. So you can do that if you want someone to double check it or you just want someone to know as a verification. This is kind of one of those just because your neighbor does it doesn't mean you can do it type of a thing you have to get used to. 
But it's also a great way in a community, as was mentioned earlier, if WSDA gets a call like, hey, Farmer John's applying, I don't think you should be out there, they can call Farmer John, he can say, I did my due diligence, I did my sheet, everything's great to go, my field's fine, my crop needs it right now, and they'll say, awesome, happy farming to you. So those are kind of the, a way to verify that, to use this as just a, a secondary tool to make sure you're thinking through. And the first time you do it, it's gonna take 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe, because you're thinking about it, you're going through. But it, you can get this down to three to five minutes. You can get it down pretty quick. Um, and the farmers I've worked with on this, you know, kind of, they do figure it out pretty quick and they get through it. So a couple things though, let's say, that manure spreading advisory said it's high. If it's red, go back to bed. And the arm worksheet said that it's high, but you still want to get out there. Why? Because maybe you had a broken gutter and you have way too much water right now, your lagoon's overfilled, or you're just a nervous smelly <coughs> and you just want to get out there because you know your crop really wants it. Well, if everything says high, my best guidance to you is don't apply. I mean, you will have in most likely cases, a runoff event if everything is high and you still go out there. In fact, I had a farmer do that. He, you know, called and said, all this stuff is high and I need to get out there and I'm going anyway. And I said, all right, and he had to discharge. And that was his choice. So this is, all of this is giving you a lot of flexibility in farming, but it's also giving you accountability for your choices. It's asking you to do a little bit more, which is why you're here today to learn how to do that, right? Giving you more information and more ways to calculate this stuff, but giving you flexibility that, in our county, for instance, we have set application dates, a no and a yes on when you can go. And we've gotten rid of that with something like this and said, you apply when your field says it's okay and your crop actually needs it. That does not mean you're gonna be out there in the middle of December. That likely one of those things is not gonna match up. But if you've got low risk fields, getting out in January is awesome. We've seen 20 to 40% forage increase value when we can get out there early. But not all your fields. You may have a very small percentage of fields or maybe none at all that qualify for that. But those fields are the ones you're gonna be pulling off of earlier because those are our high leaching ones, right? So each of your fields now is gonna have a little bit of a custom application window based on those various things. But if you have an emergency situation and your lagoon is high, something screwed up this year and you're gonna fix it next year, but in the meantime, you need to get out, maybe you can find a low risk field. Maybe you have one and you can get that assessment done or you have part of one. There are ways to work through that. Maybe your neighbor has one and they're willing to let you get out there and get some nutrients out there and that's great. Oftentimes, you're just gonna have to find another place to take it, whether that's a digester or a lagoon or somewhere else that will take that manure for you. Um, and if you can, you're just gonna hold that. If you just wanna get your antsy, you're just gonna hold it until you can get out to that appropriate field at that time of year. And I do want to note that, as I kind of mentioned this once, this is not an alternative to storage. This isn't saying like, oh, sweet, I can get out there earlier if I, you know, kind of screw around with this worksheet and get some stuff out there. No, it's still saying you have to do really good storage management. You've got to cover your stacks or you need to um, do good clean water management, whatever it may be. You still have to do your due diligence there. And then this worksheet, all these tools are on the honor system and farmers are tons, you have so much trust and ownership that this should be pretty good for you guys to go through this. I have no doubt um, that you can work through that. And if you're interested in this, what I recommend is you call your planner at your conservation district, Scratch, that's me, uh, you can call me if you want, and I will refer you to your planner. Uh, but call your planner at your district, Make sure you have all those recent soil tests and manure tests and whatever else you have. It's going to help a ton to be able to figure out your fields and what's happening. They'll help you do that field evaluation with you. Um, when this happens, it's kind of you do the office part and then you sit down with the farmer who's like, oh, no, this, this part's high. And you got this part. I mean, you guys, it's incredible how much uh, cool stuff you know about your fields. And then creating that custom schedule and then using those tools. And if you forget, you know, oh, what was she talking about? What am I supposed to do? On the back of this card is a four step easy for you. One, check the manure spray advisory. Two, fill out that worksheet. Three, use those setback distances. And four, have fun farming. So you can do those. So kind of shifting just a hair on what else can you do to minimize risk? So 
Whew, that was a lot, right? So you've got these tools. I probably made that sound really confusing and full of stuff, but you're gonna go through it once or twice and be like, oh, that wasn't so hard. And if you do have questions on that website, again, there's more information than you could ever deal with. It's incredible. So some other things you can do. Let's talk about liquid manure and then solid manure, so a little bit separately. And number one, of course, is always figuring out with those soil tests, do you even need manure? This is the most important at the end of the year. The beginning of the year, your fields kind of wash themselves clean all winter long for better or for worse. But in that September, October period, do you actually need it out there? Use those fall nitrate tests to figure that out. Andy Berry, one of our other <laughs> speakers, always says, if your nitrate is below 10 parts per million, you go buy yourself a beer. You did a good job. If it's above 40, no beer for you. So you're going to have to readjust things. So that's a nice way to kind of use that tool for you to figure out that end of the year. Or some folks say, well, I just got my corn crop off and I'm planting a cover crop. You know, I want to make sure it's got everything it needs. Trust me, if you've got more than 25 parts per million out there, your cover crop's going to make it just fine. You may get one application on it around this time of year, only if you're going to harvest it. If it may or may not need it, soil tests will help you figure that out, and, um, and you can go forth there. Otherwise, uh, it's not usually needed. Injection or aeration is best in high risk seasons. If you can do this, that's always the best method because it gets it into that soil surface. Obser oops. Observing the forecast, obviously, this is going to be your biggest friend in getting things out there and avoiding an issue. Watching for swales and slopes, these are those hidden pieces of your field that will get you in trouble if you don't respect them. So you can have that like, oh, there's sort of a swale and it eventually goes out there, but I oh, don't worry about it. And you're going to get out there, manure, you're going to have the one event and it's just going to slowly meander it out there while you watch it and freak out. So have respect for those areas and just don't go in them if you need to. Fence them off if you're grazing during a short period of the year. You may only have to do that once, but it's going to save you a lot of hassle and a trip from Sherry out there if you do so. And follow that manure setback guidance so that you're always having that kind of extra kind of insurance policy out there, that extra bit of good management. And when we think about solids, it's all about the same. Our first one here again, observing those setback distances, but even more so, why? Because solids goes on top and stays there. Liquid is gonna infiltrate somewhat into the soil, but the solids takes a lot longer to break down and do that. It either has to be broken down by a little bit of rain on there, or by kind of the soil microbes and bugs and everything else coming up and taking it away. You just have to be a lot more careful about it. And you may even want larger setbacks if you're getting it out at a risky time. So just consider that because it's just there for longer. Incorporate it if you can. This can be harrowing it, tilling it, however it needs to be done that's appropriate for your crop, for your field, for your needs. And if you pile it in the fields, which isn't necessarily recommended, but it's done quite often, uh, especially with compost if you've got it or you've got all these solids and you just want to get it out there when it's dry so that later on when you want to till it in when it's wet, you don't have to make all these extra trips and compact and tear up your field. I get it. But if you do it, bigger piles are better. Do not have a ton of these little tiny piles. Why? Because you have increased the surface area for rain to get on there and for that stuff to travel. You've essentially made this kind of corridor of potential transport. So if you have one big pile on that drier spot, that place that doesn't drain as far away from the ditch as possible, great. And you're also gonna have a lot less nutrient losses if that pile is bigger because it'll kind of create like an anaerobic seal on the outside and keep all that lovely nitrogen and good stuff in there. If you spread it out again, you have more nitrogen loss as ammonia that'll volatilize right off those piles. So bigger piles are better um, in a safe area. If you put it out in October, by the way, that is months and months that it can possibly transport. That sediment losses, nutrient losses, pathogens, etc. A couple handful of guidelines, do not store piles in fields in a floodplain. If you get a flood, there it all goes, um, and you've lost all that. Within 100 feet of a water body is recommended, if not farther, not on a slope either. Uh, within 250 feet of drinking wells, irrigation wells, 
um, as well, but particularly drinking wells. Why? Because if those wells aren't sealed well or something else, it'll that nutrient will soak somewhat into the soil. It keeps leaching it out, and it'll transport and move out, and it can get to wells. Um, no slopes and near neighbors. This is just strictly based on if you have fussy neighbors who always complain about you. This just limits some of those problems. So be a good neighbor. That's all. Um, and not on well-drained soils. And you can probably think about why, because it's just going to leach, 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 leach all fall and all the other times. So we have less leaching concern in the spring, but it can still happen if you've had it out there for months and months. So um, your heavier soils, which are going to transport better, are better from leaching, etc. So the point being that it's always an educated decision on where you're going to do this, but these are just some things to keep in mind. Planting relay and cover crops, if you plant an annual crop of whatever variety, having something on your cover, whether that's in row cover if you've got a berry field, or um, regular cover if you've planted corn or some other annual crop, these have a lot of positive things. Number one, they're going to reduce transport of sediment. You have worked very hard on building up that soil. And again, it is the key to your farming success in future, so let's keep it there. That manure in particular that you're putting out is the best thing possible for you. So all that organic matter, all that good stuff, let's keep it there uh, where you want it. So cover crops are going to help that. They're also going to take up a lot of that end of nutrients so that whatever's left over at the end of the season, it's going to take a good chunk of that up for you. And of course, it can be harvested for feed. What could be better? Uh, having a whole nother crop, if you need that, uh, less reliance on outside feed sources, it's amazing. And then lastly, vegetative stream buffers. You have a million options for various things here. It can be a dedicated grass way, grass waterway, filter strip kind of a deal. You can do hedgerows here. If you have more of a drift issue or you additionally have drainage ditch problems where it just clogs up with grass, canary grass every year, or you do a great job maintaining yours, but your neighbor never does, it drives you insane, it floods all your fields or whatever it may be, planting a thick hedgerow will actually shade out those streams that grass won't grow and you'll keep your water moving pretty well and you've given up 10, 15 feet max along the waterway. So you have some interesting options. Um, again, having them in rows, even if it's just during the growing season, this can, or during the non-growing season, this can be very helpful. Uh, so a lot of options, someone from your district can give you now there's probably handouts in the back, I'm guessing, on some of these, but there always is a lot of options. So with all you've received today, and particularly with this talk, if we have a little reflection moment. In hindsight, is there anything you might have done differently? You can answer in your head, by the way. Uh, is there anything you would have done differently last year? Now that you've thought about it, like, ooh, I didn't know or that was a good idea, whatever it may be. And then even better, we're still very early in the season. You know, you've got a whole year of manure planning, crop planning, everything else ahead of you. With what you've learned today, or some of these tools, what are you going to do different this coming year? How can you utilize your manure even better? If you're someone who has too much of it and you're always trying to get rid of it, be creative about that too. You have neighbors who don't have enough, so share. Um, looking at something like that as well is really important. And seeing the value rather than the waste in these products and really honoring what that is and putting that towards the economics of your farm, putting it to the nutrient balance of your farm and understanding how all those things work together is extremely important. So with that, I will take um, any questions that you may have.